we greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. A sad occasion for us today, a day of rejoicing for Paul in heaven. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. That's the promise of the Word of God. And although each of us here are filled with grief and sorrow in our hearts, yet we are thankful that Paul Hafner knew Jesus Christ as his Savior. And the Word of God is always true. The Word of God has given encouragement and hope for the last 2,000 years to believers. As we gather here today, we temper our sorrow with the joy of knowing that there is eternal life. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of being here today. We thank you, Father, that Paul knew Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. We thank you, Father, that in your mercy and grace, you gave him eternal life, and that today he is with you in heaven. As we go through this memorial service, we pray that you might grant special comfort, special encouragement, special strength to the heart of those who are left behind. Father, though he's not able to be with us today, we pray for Roy and his wife Debbie down in Kentucky. We pray for your encouragement to them, to their children, Dean and Brian and Keith. Father, I pray for your blessings on Steve, who is here today with his wife, Kim. I pray for your blessings on their children, Riley and Colin and Kieran. Father, we pray for your encouragement to all those who are good friends, those who work with him, those who knew him here from the church, those with whom he interacted, the great times of fun and encouragement that we had with Paul in the days that are past. As we remember these things, help us to remember that someday all of us will also step out of this life and into the next. We pray that you would teach us to apply our hearts to wisdom because someday we too will have to give an account for the things which we have done in this body. And so Father, we pray for your blessings upon this service. We pray that as the word of God goes forth, that you would use your word in a supernatural way, that as you have promised, it would not return unto you void, but that it would accomplish that which you please, and that it would prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. And so, Father, we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. One of Paul's favorite hymns, and also one of the favorite hymns of his mom, was Silent Night, and she had asked that it be sung at her memorial service several years ago, and we've had that request also for today. So although you may think of it as a Christmas hymn, it is indeed very appropriate because it tells of the day that our Lord Jesus Christ came into this world so that he might die for us, who are sinners, pay for our penalty, and give us eternal life. Let's turn to number 253, you may remain seated and we'll sing all the verses of Silent Night.
God has a great deal of comfort for us. One of the passages that Paul particularly loved because it was a passage that I had read to his mother in the hospital shortly before her death. It became one of the favorite passages of Paul. And that's from the book of Psalms. Psalm 34, if you'd like to follow along. I'll be reading the entire psalm. God's word for his people. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and he delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened. Their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth around about them that fear him and delivereth them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is he that desireth life? and loveth many days, that he may see good. Keep thy tongue from evil, and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good, seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. Amen. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. May he bless our hearts with a deeper understanding of it. Amen. Please turn with me to hymn number 635 in the garden. We'll sing all the verses of number 635. Oh, 
hushed their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there no other has ever known I stay in the garden with him though the night around me be falling but he bids me go through the voice of woe his voice to me is calling and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there no other has ever known Amen Amen God has given to us some great and precious promises concerning heaven. I'm reading from Revelation chapter 22 verses 1 through 7 and then verses 20 and 21. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb in the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. There shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly, Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Please join me in singing number 343, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. T'was blind, but now I see. That's Paul's testimony. I once was lost, but now I'm found. T'was blind, but now I see. Number 343. Oh! 
ourselves experiencing that now. When we've been there 10,000 years, 10 million years, 10 billion years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we'd first begun. Heaven, eternity, Paul's there. How do we get there? Jesus told us God's way to heaven in John chapter 14, in verses 1 through 6. This is just before he went to the cross. He had prophesied his death. He'd prophesied his burial for three days. He'd prophesied his resurrection from the dead. And the disciples were troubled that he had told them that he was going to die. And so we have his words at the upper room right before he went to Gethsemane and from there to his trials in the cross, his words of comfort. John 14, beginning in verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Behold, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Amen. Amen. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. May he bless our hearts with a deeper understanding of it. Amen.
Kathy, our organist, was one of Paul's good friends, and she wanted especially to be able to sing that in his memory. I changed the order of service a bit because we had some folks who were coming late, and so we want to go back to that section where it says, Memorial Words by Family and Friends. And I know Brother Steve and a couple of his children would like to share. And then anyone else who would like to share a word of memory about something perhaps Paul did in your life that was meaningful, some happy memory, some sobering and thoughtful memories, something that you would like to share in memory of Paul. Steve, would you like to come with your children?
there someone else who would like to give a testimony? Please feel free. Thank you, Scott. It's great to have a man like Paul. Today I bury my friend. Some of you will be able to identify with this. Although I was often exasperated with Paul, I knew that he was my true friend. He loved this ministry. He participated faithfully in prayer meeting and often shared his prayer requests for many of you who are sitting here today, especially family members. He loved the Bible's teaching on creation, and I know that he would have been very excited to come with us in just a few weeks, as we have a bus trip with more than 50 people going to the Creation Museum in Kentucky. He faithfully supported this ministry with his finances. Personally, he often brought me magazine articles and newspapers that showed the persecution of Christians and others around the world. He helped in practical ways related to his skills in metalworking, like providing heavy steel plates to cover areas where we'd had to jackhammer through the floors to uncover leaking steam pipes. He didn't mind getting his hands dirty with that kind of work. Just last week, only days before his death, he brought snacks and other things to be used for the children in our summer Bible school, which is being held all this week and next week, every evening. Paul was a man that I could ask to do something, and he would do it. On perhaps a more humorous note, I often rebuked him for being late to services. <laughs> and he would always reply that he was listening to my father preach on the radio with these words, you wouldn't want me to miss your father's preaching, would you? <laughs> How are you supposed to answer that? <laughs> you know, as we remember the life of Paul Hafner today, I want to share with you how we can know for sure that he is in heaven. I also want to share with you how you can know for sure that heaven is yours as well, and that you'll be able to see him again someday. So let's talk about how we know things for sure, so that even children can understand. We all believe that we know some things for sure, some of the things we know because we have experienced them. We know what ice cream tastes like because we've eaten it. We can tell the difference between chocolate and vanilla and strawberry. We know it's supposed to be eaten when it's cold. We know the difference between the sound of a bird and a honking horn because we've experienced both. We know the pleasant feel of a cool sea breeze and the painful burn of a hot stove. Experiences come to us through our five senses. Sight and taste, smell and hearing and touch. Many things we think we know for sure because we have experienced them in the physical realm. And after many similar encounters, we are confident that these tangible things are real and always have basically the same characteristics. But you know, sometimes our physical senses deceive us. We've all seen the sleight of hand artist who makes rabbits appear out of empty hats or makes ping pong balls disappear or cuts his assistant in half and then puts her back together with no damage. We enjoy being fooled. Our taste buds deceive us when we drink diet cola, that weird stuff, and our brain believes that we've just tasted sugar instead of other highly complex chemicals. Electronic synthesizers can deceive us into thinking that we've heard a cello or a submachine gun or a creaking door. We know some things by experiencing them with our five senses. Another way that we know things, quote, for sure, is that someone whom we trust 
has told us. We grew up with parents who taught us not to run out in the street because we might be hit by a truck, not to scream at night because it annoys the neighbors, and to sit up straight at the table or we'd spill food in our laps. We graduated to kindergarten and we learned our colors, our numbers, and our letters. Then we learned that there are various shades of the colors, that numbers can be very big or very small. In fact, so small that they're just a tiny part of other numbers. And that when you put them together just right, they tell you all kinds of amazing things about the world around you. We later learned that letters make words. And we had the delight of learning the different ways to write letters and words and then to write sentences and paragraphs and essays and stories. We trusted our teachers and learned things that would help us in this life to succeed with the various talents that God gave to us. But sadly, we all know of times that people we trusted deceived us or tricked us, or in some cases were just plain wrong. But you know, there were other ways we learned also, not merely through experience, not merely through learning from people that we trusted, but we learned some things through direct memorization. We learned some things by discovering how to reason and how to reach correct conclusions. We learned some things by scientific experiments that we repeated over and over and always got the same results. We learned the scientific method and we began to trust science. We also learned the truth about some things that we couldn't see with our eyes or hear with our ears or smell with our noses. We learned that dogs can hear and smell things that we can't hear and smell. And yet those sounds and smells were very real, even though we couldn't sense them at all. But then we discovered that not all things are subject to the scientific method. We learned that some things are true, even though we cannot repeat them under the same conditions multiple times. That's the scientific method. We learned that history is real. We learned about George Washington and the American Revolution. We learned about Napoleon, the Battle of Waterloo. We learned about Genghis Khan and the Mongolian hordes and the Vikings and Julius Caesar when we struggled through the Gaelic Wars of Latin chapter of Latin two. But you know, there was another important way we learned, very important way. We read things that were written by eyewitnesses to the events. We saw artifacts and broken pottery and ancient relics and museums, and we trusted the curators to tell us the truth about the events of history because they had spent so many years studying the tiny pieces of history and putting it together. We learned another way. We learned the legal method of analyzing truth about historical events. We saw that sometimes scientific evidence was presented, but many times the outcome of a trial depended solely on eyewitnesses and the veracity and consistency of their testimony with other eyewitnesses. We learned that some things are 100% true, even though we can't put them in a test tube. And that's important when we talk about heaven. When we talk about heaven, we have the privilege of using one other means of learning truth. It's very similar to some of the ways that we've just briefly discussed, but it has an added element. As with the legal method, we have trustworthy witnesses. As with the scientific and historical methods, we can examine artifacts and writings. But the added element that we have when we talk about heaven is that God is added to the equation. We suddenly expand outside the physical realm of our five senses to something far larger, far more beautiful, far more glorious, and far more real. We now have someone whom we can absolutely trust, more than we ever trusted a teacher or a friend or a cherished loved one. We've entered a realm where we have a witness who knows everything and is never wrong. We've entered a realm where the witness never lies. We've entered a realm where the witness not only tells the truth, but he tells the whole truth and nothing but the truth. We've entered a realm where faith is never disappointed, deceived, or destroyed. 
When we speak of heaven, we've entered a realm where God has revealed himself to us in such a way that we can understand. We've entered a realm where God himself has penetrated human history personally and has given us his written word so that we might know for sure the things that otherwise we could never know. Other ways that we learn to know the truth may help us in a feeble way. But when we see what God has revealed through Christ and in his word, we can know the experientially unknowable with absolute certainty. We can know about heaven with precise accuracy. And we can know without a question or a doubt who makes it into heaven and who does not. We approach our quest for knowing about heaven in the same way that we trusted our parents, our teachers, our senses, our reason, our intuition. In all of those cases, we came by faith. Oh, yes, our, our faith is a flimsy faith. It's weak. It's terrified. But the object of our faith is eternal, immovable, unchanging, irresistible, almighty, perfect, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, absolutely truthful, and ever loving in our hours of grief. Don't worry about how flimsy your faith is. Look at the immutable object of your faith, Jesus Christ. That's what makes faith either valid or a fraud. Your faith is worth no more than the one in whom you put your faith. If the object of your faith is unreliable, it doesn't matter how much you believe because it will not improve the reliability of the one in whom you have put your faith. For example, you can really, really, really believe that a broken chair will hold you up. And you know what? It'll still collapse. No matter how much you believe it's going to hold you up. It's an unreliable object of faith. You merely set yourself up for delusion and disappointment. On the other hand, you can have a perfectly reliable object of faith, a perfectly sturdy chair, and you know what? You can believe the wrong thing about it. You can think that the chair will collapse when you sit on it, and it doesn't. The issue is not how big is your faith. The issue is the object of your faith. What are you trusting? You may want so badly to have something that you think you, your misplaced desire is faith, and then you're disappointed when you don't get what you wanted. That often happens when we want desperately for a loved one to keep on living so that we will not have to experience the suffering of being separated. And then we're disappointed because we've trusted our own desire rather than looking at our loved one through the eyes of Jesus who loves that one more than we ever dreamed. Jesus, who has taken the loved one safely through the valley of the shadow of death to a place where there is no more death. Dearly beloved, Paul Hafner is more alive today than he ever was when he was in this world. You look at those pictures back there, he was a handsome young man. But today he's more handsome, he's stronger, he's more alert than he ever was before. All of his senses are perfect. He can see things he never saw before, hear things that were impossible to hear in this world, taste and smell and touch textures he could never before discern. How do we know? Because we have the promises of God who never lies. And he has told us what we need to know to comfort our hearts on two critical issues. Number one, the reality of heaven. And number two, precisely who will be there and who will not be there. Just a moment ago, we read that incredible description of heaven given in Revelation chapter 22. I encourage you to read all of Revelation 21 and 22 and to meditate 
on each glorious description that you find written there. It's a place of unspeakable beauty, unspeakable majesty. It's a place of perfect holiness and joy. It's a place of music and singing. It's a place of blessed fellowship with Christians who have preceded us in death. It's a place where the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords reigns. It's a place where all tears will be wiped away from our eyes. It's a place where there is no more crying or sorrow or suffering or death or separated from our saved loved ones anymore. It is a place of glory and of grace. It's a place of rest and peace. It's heaven and it's real. The living God who never lies has told us that it is real. It is so magnificent that it's beyond the reach of our pale senses, even as the unseen bands of light in the outer reaches of the spectrum are beyond our sight and the ultra high frequencies are beyond our hearing. But the more pressing question for us at this hour is, who is there? How can we know for sure that Paul Hafner is there? And here the word of God who cannot lie has also given us the answer. The God of all comfort who knows our distress at this hour has given a soothing balm to quiet our souls. From 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 we read, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. He's speaking of those who have died in Christ. And he speaks of them as just being asleep. That you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. When Paul wrote that, there had been Christians who had died at Thessalonica. The church was in a state of distress. They were afraid of what had become of their loved ones. They were filled with sorrow. And so Paul wrote to remind them of the promises of God. Those who sleep in Jesus are with him now because he will bring them with him when he returns. But that brings us to a crucial distinction. How do you know for sure you're a Christian? How do you know for sure that if you die before the Lord returns that you'll be in heaven with him? There are some people who call themselves Christians, and we all know that they're not. You know, putting a wheelbarrow into a garage does not make it a car any more than putting a hypocrite into a church makes him into a Christian. There are real Christians, and there are phonies. What's the difference? Do you remember the passage we read in John 14? Jesus, in that very context, is describing heaven and promising to prepare a place for those of us who have trusted him. He told us how to get there. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. The way to heaven is simple. The way to heaven is easy. The way to heaven is clear. And the way to heaven is exclusive. The way to heaven is by trusting Christ alone. You see, we're all separated from God because of our sins. God is holy, we're unholy. God is righteous, we're unrighteous. But God has made a way for us to be brought back to him. Our Lord Jesus Christ came to earth and died to pay the penalty for our sins. He was buried, and three days later he bodily and literally rose from the dead. And that is one of the best attested facts of history with over 500 eyewitnesses to the resurrection. That would pass the test of any court of law today. They're described in 1 Corinthians 15. 
That's the proof that his death for our sins accomplished its purpose and that he didn't merely die a martyr's death. Jesus promised, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Paul understood. Paul trusted Jesus Christ alone to save him from his sins. I knew Paul well. I know he did. Paul was not relying on his personal goodness or his tithes or his church membership or his benevolent love for his family to get him into heaven. He had trusted in Jesus Christ to give him eternal life. That's how we know for sure that he is in heaven today even as I speak. That's how we know for sure that he has no more suffering or sorrow or pain. Friends, you can either believe the sovereign God of the universe who never lies or you can call him a liar. Those are really the only two options. We believe people who are sometimes right and sometimes wrong. What stands in the way of believing God who is never wrong? He's told us that heaven is real. He's told us that it's populated by a very specific group of people. He's told us that the only ones who get there are those who have trusted in Christ to save them. He's told us that they're eternally secure and never lose their salvation. Paul Hafner trusted in Christ alone, who died for his sins, who was buried, who rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Therefore, we know with a certainty that Paul Hafner is with our Lord Jesus Christ in heaven today. Remember what Jesus said? In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. And Thomas said unto him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Just a few days ago, our Lord Jesus finished the mansion that he was preparing for Paul Hafner. It was finished precisely on time. Our dear brother Paul took his final breath, and he reached out and took the hand of Jesus, who looked him in the eyes and said, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. I want to hear those words when I die. I hope you do too. I also suspect that Jesus may have said something like this. Welcome home, Paul. Come and see the beautiful place that I've prepared just for you. It was the most beautiful place that Paul had ever seen. But I suspect that he couldn't take his eyes off Jesus. The nail-pierced hand that was holding his hand. The wounded side where he held Paul close. The gentle kindness as Paul gazed into his eyes and saw the infinite love of Jesus that sent Jesus to the cross for Paul. Yes, we know for sure. We see it with the eye of faith in the one who is the object of our faith. That's what makes faith either valid or false. The object of our faith is Christ, who never fails, who never leaves us or forsakes us, who is always there to comfort us in the hour of our distress. The one who is our risen Lord, who has gone to prepare a place for us, if only we will trust him. That's God's grace. We don't deserve it, but he offers eternal life in heaven to us by grace through faith in Jesus who bought it for us with his blood. Grace alone. Faith alone. Christ alone. Is Paul in heaven? Yes. Not because of his own good works, but because of the grace of God that drew Paul to trust in Christ alone. 
Will you see Paul again in heaven? Yes, emphatically. But only if you trust Christ alone to save you from your sins. The one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the privilege of knowing for sure that Paul is in heaven with you. How we thank you for the privilege of knowing for sure that we also are guaranteed eternal life and a mansion in glory if we but trust in Christ alone. Jesus, God, who became man, who lived a perfect life, who died on this earth on a cross to pay for our sins and satisfy the righteous judgment of God against evil, and then rose from the dead, proving that his sacrifice was accepted and that his offer of salvation is true. Father, I pray that if there's anyone here today who doesn't know Jesus as his or her Savior, that today they might pray a simple prayer in their own hearts and say, Father, I've sinned. I know Jesus died for me. I know he rose from the dead. I believe in him to give me life. I believe him with all my heart. I'm not trusting anything else but Jesus only. Father, I pray that that would be so today in the hearts of someone either here or watching over the internet to trust in Christ alone and know with certainty that someday we'll see Paul again. For those great promises, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. In closing, we'll turn to number 769. We'll sing only the first verse. And let's stand to sing. When all my labors and trials are o'er and I am safe on that beautiful shore, just to be near the dear Lord I adore, will through the ages be glory for me. Let's stand to sing verse 1 of number 769. from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty dominion and power now and ever Amen And I'd like to ask the funeral director, Kevin Comber, to come forward and give us instructions for the car.